welcome back to a new series of 60 Minutes. Tonight, a battle being fought above and below our waters. The desperate race to save the world's smallest and rarest dolphin, Maui's dolphin, from extinction. Found only off our coastline, this tiny creature is all but gone. And now the world's leading conservationists are calling for a complete set net ban in all areas that the dolphins are believed to live. On the other side, the Taranaki fishermen, on the brink of extinction themselves, being driven out of business by government restrictions, protecting a dolphin they say isn't there. A marine mammal and an industry both fighting for survival and putting New Zealand's global environmental reputation on the line. 60 Minutes spent time with the campaigners, the fishermen and the dolphins. They are your kiwi of the sea. They are your hobbit of the sea. They are the world's smallest dolphins. And they are very rare and they are going extinct. And they need help. It's a battle for survival on two fronts. Beneath the waves, the sleek creatures that are the world's smallest and rarest dolphins, unique to New Zealand and on the brink of extinction. They're heading closer and closer and closer to the abyss. The, for Maui's dolphins, the situation is, is absolutely critical. They have no time to waste anymore. They're almost gone. And above water, the Taranaki fishermen, copping the flack for the dolphins' demise. Being squeezed by restrictions on where they can fish as the government extends set net bans off the coastline. It's a struggle to make ends meet. It's every day. I just wonder when it's going to be the last day that I can pay the crew, the staff. It's, it's, it's a real struggle. It's an industry in crisis. Livelihoods on the line. Hard men of the sea feeling the pressure. To be point blank accused of being a Maui killer, that hurts. Oh, it's, been, it's been tough. Just um, to think you could lose everything, it's, it's tough, yeah. Right in front of you now, ladies. Anyone who's encountered a dolphin in the wild is unlikely to ever forget it. There's an affinity beyond explanation between man and this playful, curious, intelligent marine mammal. The smallest and most endangered of the species are the Hectors and Maui's dolphins, which live only in the waters off our coast. There's an estimated 7,000 Hectors dolphins left, down from around 30,000 in the 1970s. Their rarer cousins, the Maui's, are found only off the North Island's west coast, and they are teetering on extinction, with just 55 left. Conservationists and marine mammal scientists from around the world are battling to bring them back from the brink. Just how dire is the situation for Hectors and Maui's dolphins? For Maui's dolphins, the situation is, is absolutely critical. They have no time to waste anymore. They're almost gone. We're down from about 1,800, 2,000 ish to 50 individuals. Um, if you think that half of those will be breeding, uh, will be females, and you know a fraction of those will be breeding females, you can see how dire it is. London-based German Dr. Barbara Maas is the head of species conservation for NABU, one of the world's oldest and largest environmental organisations. It's 14 years since she first came across the Hectors and Maui's dolphins while working here for the Department of Conservation they became a passion, and she's become dedicated to saving them. I would have thought that if you can save a dolphin species anywhere, New Zealand would be the ideal place for a dolphin species to become endangered, because I would have thought that no way will people let it happen. Because New Zealand 
has this reputation. This is why I moved here in 2000, why I wanted to live here, because I thought it's a clean country, it's environmentally aware, it looks after its environment. And it was like a bit of a slap in, you know, a punch in the face to see that this is not true. The question is, what's killing the dolphins? How have numbers got so low they're listed as a critically endangered species? And this is what the fight is all about. Hectares and Maui's being caught in commercial fishing nets off our coastline, and whether that's to blame for the devastating drop in dolphin numbers. The scientists looked at all the threats that could possibly face Maui's dolphins, disease, pollution, um, and fishing, and they decided, they came to the conclusion after reviewing all the data that have been collated over the course of 30 years or so, that fishing is by far the biggest threat, and that um, gill netting and trawling together account for about 95.5% of Maui's dolphins' deaths. What needs to happen is the nets need to come out of the water, and that's trawl nets and set nets. We're not asking for something outlandish, um, but that is necessary to save the dolphins. But of course, this is an inconvenient truth for the fishing industry because it would impact on the activities of fishermen. That's what brought Barbara Maas back to New Zealand in December, helping organize a march on Parliament, a funeral procession, for the dolphins she says are a national treasure, like the kiwi and the kakapo, which should be protected at all costs. That's what they need, friends in New Zealand that care and say to whoever is in power, save our Maui's and Hector's dolphins, so that people can still look at them when I'm long forgotten. Um, that, you know, your children and your children's children can still see Maui's dolphins and that New Zealand says, we didn't know, now we know, and now we're gonna act to save these animals. Our government is doing everything practically possible to ensure that our precious Maui's dolphins survive. Conservation Minister Nick Smith is responsible for steering the government on the issue. If I look at the steps that have been taken over the last five years, we've actually more than doubled the area of protection. We have banned trawling in a huge area. We now have more than 100 square kilometres of sanctuary for each Maui's dolphin. Up next on 60 Minutes as the world watches on is New Zealand's clean green reputation at stake over the plight of the Maui's dolphin. Our management of marine mammal conservation doesn't really fit in with that 100% pure slogan. minutes followed Barbara Mars to Banks Peninsula, Akaroa, a place she visits most years, revelling in any chance to observe and spend time with the dolphins. In the summer months, the sleepy harbour is transformed into a thriving tourist destination, and the opportunity to swim with the dolphins is the jewel in Akaroa's crown. Black cat cruises have been taking people out for years. A portion of every fare goes towards dolphin research. These close encounters with Hector's dolphins bringing in the crowds at more than $10 million into the local economy. As humans, why do we love dolphins so much? They are social animals, so they live in groups. So I think people perhaps identify with them. Um, because we like to think of ourselves as, as social and 
and uh, friendly and they're intelligent so we uh, perhaps we like to you know we see some kind of affinity and relationship similarities we can identify with them awesome. that was the best thing ever <laughs> thank you so much for arranging this perfect in June, Akaroa Harbour will become a designated marine reserve. Scientists warn New Zealand's clean, green, international reputation is on the line over the dolphin issue. It's this very reputation which brought 1,200 of the world's leading marine mammal scientists and conservationists to Dunedin in December. High on their conference agenda, the plight of the Maui's dolphin. We would talk to as many fishermen as we could. Many of those individuals uh, admitted straight off the bat that, they, um, that they'd caught Hector's dolphins, so it was clear from the outset that there could be a conservation problem. Otago University's Liz Sluton is one of New Zealand's foremost experts on the Maui's and Hector's. Is there a cause for embarrassment that we pride ourselves on being clean and green and yet we're not able to save our own dolphin? It is really embarrassing and I think quite a surprise to the international visitors. You know, the uh, Clean and Green New Zealand campaign, the 100% Pure campaign have been incredibly successful and so many people from overseas simply assume that we would have our dolphin conservation under control and they will be quite surprised to hear that actually the, our management of marine mammal conservation doesn't really fit in with that 100% Pure slogan. Sluton and partner Steve Dawson have spent much of the last 30 years studying the dolphins, tracking their movements, analysing the risk. If we're going to bring them back, basically we need to do everything we possibly can and we need to do it right now. So we are still using a fishing method that's well known worldwide to kill dolphins in the habitat of this dolphin, of which there are only 55 left. So it makes you feel like shaking the person from the Ministry of Fisheries that you're talking to and saying, hello, is there anybody in there? You know, it's like the science community and the conservation community could not be waving a bigger red flag. This is the biggest red flag we've got. The government insists it's doing all it can, imposing a series of restrictions, limiting where set nets and trawling can be used off the Taranaki coast. So the first protections were put on 03, in 2008, that area was trebled. In January of 2012, where a Maui's dolphin caught in a set net was found dead on the Taranaki Peninsula. At that time, we extended the boundary around the Taranaki Peninsula, and then subsequently, with additional observations this year, have added a further 350 square k. But the scientists say it's too little, too late. The government tends to play this kind of, oh, it's all very uncertain and complicated and we're not sure and let's do another 20 years' worth of research and then we'll do something, um, which is just completely unreasonable. And the International Whaling Commission's got even further and has said there is no need for further research. In other words, don't you go playing for time. You know, you really need to make a decision right now. You have plenty of information in hand to make that decision. There is huge emotion and passion around the survival of the Maui's dolphin. I think we've got over 80,000 submissions from people. Uh, many of them, you know, they accuse me of being responsible for being the dolphin killer and all those things. And look, I appreciate that passion. Equally so, you know, I've met face to face with those fishermen. They're good, salt of the earth Kiwis. They're just trying to go out and do it, get a living. They see a very low risk to the Maui's dolphin. And so you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Coming up after the break, we head out with the fishermen who say the government's growing restrictions are pushing them further out to sea and out of business. I've been in the industry for 28 years um, and some of these fishermen are on the edge of the cliff. Welcome back to the show and our story on Maui's Dolphin. 
This small marine mammal is found only in the waters off New Zealand and is teetering on the brink of extinction, with an estimated 55 left. Scientists and conservationists from around the world say the only way they can be saved is by imposing a complete set net ban. But this would come at a hefty price, potentially putting out of business the fishermen who make a living from those waters. Some of them are already struggling to survive, and all to save a dolphin which they say isn't in their patch. Dolphins are mammals like we are, that means they need to breathe air. They either asphyxiate by holding their breath or eventually draw, try and breathe and will inhale water and, and drown. Not a very pleasant way to go. And so the battle lines are drawn. It's not only the preservation of a species on the line, there's an industry fighting for its survival too. Hey, Fishermen like Rob Ansley. These waters have been his turf for the last 30 years. He knows them better than anyone. Government restrictions on where and how he can fish have pushed him close to the edge. It's, it's really tough. Um, it's, it's a struggle just to make mortgage payments. Um, I borrowed all the money to get into the business. Um, used family assets, mortgaged them up to be able to borrow the money and, that, and to it's taken all our prime fishing grounds. I've gone from like 18 staff down to uh, three. I've got two deck ends and a part-time fish cutter. So it's, it's definitely impacted the business. Rob's vessel is one of only five or six commercial fishing boats left plying these waters. Once there were dozens. And where he once fished only inside the two mile zone, the restrictions have forced them all further out all to protect a dolphin, which Rob says isn't even there. They're not here. I've never ever seen one uh, off the coast here. You're Just... certain of that? As I'm certain so... as you can be? With the amount of time I've spent out there, yeah, I, I just don't believe they're here. Uh, you might get a Hector's dolphin pass through, but I've just never ever seen one, nor caught one. So, yeah, with the amount of time I've spent on the water, it's just they're, they're not here. Keith Mawson owns the region's largest fish processor, Egmont Seafoods. He's tried hard to be the voice of reason. The only one of the fishermen that has seen a dolphin in the last 30 to 40 years, or the current fisherman in Taranaki, is Ian. Ian caught a dolphin two years ago in January. He reported it, did the right thing. Now we're in a position where we're, we're being forced to the edge of the cliff. One of the first things that crossed my mind Hell, I've never seen one before. And now I've actually got one in my net, dead. And you knew straight away what it was? Oh, straight away. Yep. I only had to see the dorsal fin. Two long, hard years have passed since Ian McDougall made the dreaded catch. He was fishing off the coast of New Plymouth when he pulled up the dolphin in his net. When you saw it and realised what it was, what were you thinking? I've basically now destroyed the local fishing industry. That was your first that thought? That was my first thought. And I can... I will never ever forget that. We've all been frightened of catching a Hector's type dolphin. Yeah. Ian McDougall, the Aussie, the shifted over here, become a commercial fisherman. He's now Ian made the decision to return the dolphin to the sea and reported it once ashore. As DNA sampling wasn't done, it's never been established if it was a Hector's or Maui's dolphin. But soon after, the Ministry of Fisheries put trained observers on board every commercial fishing boat in these waters. Since then, there's been more than 500 trips made and not a single official sighting of a Maui's dolphin. Proof the fishermen say the dolphins are not there, but the scientists aren't convinced. Because they are so rare, seeing them, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack in a, in a big body of water. And there may just be a few of them down there, 
but see, you know, being actually there when they are up and breathing and when they're not obscured by white caps or whatever, it, it's just potluck. This is, I, I think, a clear case where um, the absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Despite their demands for a complete set net ban, the government says no. My challenge to the marine mammal scientists and the broader lobby who says we haven't go far enough is show me the Maui. Show me the Maui beyond the area of which the government has put the set net ban. And if they can provide me with confirmed reliable sightings beyond that area, then I'll reconsider. But in the meantime, I'm not going to incur a cost and a ban on the fishing industry when I've got no scientific justification for doing so. Taranaki's fishing industry is worth around $15 million. Keith Mawson says the evidence the government is using to justify its latest restrictions is anything but scientific. Nick Smith's come out and said he's based it on science. I just don't believe that that's the case. Um, he's made the statement that he's had five confirmed sightings of Maui dolphins in recent years. That is, just can't be true. You can't determine a Maui or Hector dolphin from a, from a sighting. And the last sighting that was in January um, of last year um, was very dubious. The person didn't know what day they were out on the water. Um, they took three weeks to report it. Um, and we had a commercial fisherman fishing in exactly the same area at the same time. Mawson says his fishermen are hurting and the industry he helped create is on the brink of collapse. Look, I've been in the industry for 28 years um, and some of these fishermen are on the edge of the cliff. Um, they, uh, one more push and they're gone. Uh, and for me as a, um, a commercial processor here, if my fishermen go, um, then we're going to be heading in exactly the same direction. How personally have you been affected by all of this? The fear is, what else is to come? Is it going to be conservation at all costs? How do my fishermen invest in their businesses, um, knowing that there might be more restrictions coming in the future as well? We're in limbo here. We've got no support from the government. Um, They've not provided any compensation or any assistance for us to be able to continue to operate. We are not in the business of saying, and in the event that you pose a risk, then we have to compensate you for the, the lack of not being able to fish. To fish is a privilege, not a right. We know set netting is the number one killer. We need to err on the side of caution, but we shouldn't be so pure as to shut down the fishing industry where there are no reported sightings of those Maui's dolphin. The campaign to save Maui's dolphins is gaining traction and attention around the world. Some high-profile conservationists have joined the cause, including the son of Jacques Cousteau and New Zealand world champion freediver William Truebridge. He's become their official ambassador. This online video he created sparking thousands of submissions to the government. Put pressure on New Zealand's government, for it is they who are ignoring the incontestable evidence, flouting their responsibility to safeguard our species. The issue may be complicated, but the message is a simple one. Whatever we do, it's now or never, before these dolphins are lost from our waters, from the world, forever. A lot of people say, isn't it too late with 50 animals? But genetic studies have shown that it isn't. If we act now, it's not too late. They can bounce back. They're not doomed to go extinct. But we need to act now, and we need to follow the scientists' advice and recommendations now. I, I just don't feel I should lose everything because of something that's not there, and it's yeah, worked all my life, tough, you know, hard work. Nothing's easy out there. It's not good money. And to be just kicked in the cuts all the time, like if we're in Japan, we're gods, but here we're just, we're scum, it's, it's wrong. Because we're doing the right thing, we're catching food for the people when they've got it all wrong. Mm. 
Still to come on 60 Minutes, he's the most flamboyant of the Stones, the tempestuous Keith Richards. You know, there's the air you breathe, the water you drink, the food you eat, and then there's the Rolling Stones. And I guess we're just part of the furniture, you know? in this playful, curious, intelligent marine mammal. The smallest and most endangered of the species are the Hectors and Maui's dolphins, which live only in the waters off our coast. There's an estimated 7,000 Hectors dolphins left, down from around 30,000 in the 1970s. Their rarer cousins, the Maui's, are found only off the North Island's west coast, and they are teetering on extinction with just 55 left. Conservationists and marine mammal scientists from around the world are battling to bring them back from the brink. Just how dire is the situation for Hectors and Maui's dolphins? For Maui's dolphins, the situation is... Come back to a new series of 60 Minutes. Tonight, a battle being fought above and below our waters. The desperate race to save the world's smallest and rarest dolphin, Maui's dolphin, from extinction. Found only off our coastline, this tiny creature is all but gone. And now the world's leading conservationists are calling for a complete set net ban in all areas that the dolphins are believed to live. On the other side, the Taranaki fishermen, on the brink of extinction themselves, being driven out of business by government restrictions, protecting a dolphin they say isn't there. A marine mammal and an industry both fighting for survival and putting New Zealand's global environment... It's a real struggle. It's an industry in crisis, livelihoods on the line, hard men of the sea feeling the pressure. To be point-blank accused of being a Maori killer, that hurts. Oh, it's, been, it's been tough. Just um, to think you could lose everything, it's, it's tough, yeah. Anyone who's encountered a dolphin in the wild is unlikely to ever forget it. There's an affinity beyond explanation between man or reputation on the line. 60 Minutes spent time with the campaigners, the fishermen and the dolphins. They are your... Kiwi of the sea. They are your hobbit of the sea. They are the world's smallest dolphins. And they are very rare and they are going extinct. And they need help. It's a battle for survival on two fronts. Beneath the waves, the sleek creatures that are the world's smallest and rarest dolphins, unique to New Zealand and on the brink of extinction. They're heading closer and closer and closer to the abyss. The, for Maui's dolphins, the situation is, is absolutely critical. They have no time to waste anymore. They're almost gone. And above water, the Taranaki fishermen, copping the flak for the dolphins' demise. Being squeezed by restrictions on where they can fish as the government extends set net bans off the coastline. It's a struggle to make ends meet. It's every day. I just wonder when it's going to be the last day that I can pay the crew, the staff. It's, it's, it's